Welcome back with a smiling face. Important note before starting, if you are a fan of audio stories then our Patreon account is the best platform for you, join us on Patreon for the best audiobooks ever. Coming Together Episode 2 Chapter 7-14 I had a rough night. Between being verbally attacked by a total stranger and physically attacked by a cougar, I'd need a skin of granite not to let it affect me. I dreamed about the old woman and the cougar, and those were definitely nightmares. But I also dreamed of what I'd felt when that cat looked me in the eye. What I'd smelt and felt and seen. I dreamed of what had happened in the shed with the marten. My blackout. No, not a blackout. A vision of what had happened to the animal. I'd talk to mom about it later. I always went to her with things like that, because she wouldn't go all native mystical on me and talk about vision quests and whatever. Not that dad or Daniel would do that they'd been around us long enough to know better. But still, well, I'd just be more comfortable talking to mom about it. It's like my love of nature. Some people say it's because I'm native, and I know they're not trying to stereotype me, though sometimes I really wish I was into model airplanes instead. I love animals and yes, I'm native, but as my teachers would say, correlation doesn't imply causation. I have a park ranger for a father and an environmental architect for a mother. They met at a rainforest conservation rally and have raised me out in the woods. It'd be bizarre if I didn't turn out the way I did. But what had really happened tonight? With the cougar, it was obviously adrenaline with a chaser of shock, and maybe a little post-traumatic stress thrown in for good measure. One best friend had died in front of me last year. Another almost did tonight. I could rationalize it while I was awake, but once I fell asleep, I was running again ground and wind whooshing past. I smelled the musk of animals, the tang of the earth, and blood. I smelled blood and it made me run all the faster, heart speeding up not with fear but something else, something that gripped my belly like, like hunger. I bolted upright. Sweat poured down my face, and I gasped for breath as my heart pounded. My legs ached like I really had been running. I pushed off the covers, got out of bed, and went to the window. I stood there in the moonlight, hands pressed against the cool glass as I scanned the forest, looking for. I don't know what I was looking for, only that I was looking and I was aching and I wanted something. Wanted it so bad. The window was open a crack, and I could smell the rich, loamy night, just like in my dream. I bent to open it farther, then crouched there, my heart galloping. I let the cool air and the scents wash over me and, gradually, my heartbeat slowed and the sweat dried and I was left standing there, confused and shivering, until I went back to bed, pulled up the covers, and fell asleep. You could have stayed with my mom today, I said as Daniel navigated the potholes and ruts. You've got to be hurting. Nope. Don't feel a thing. Tough guy, I said. No, well-medicated guy. You really think I'd let you go to school without me? I'd show up tomorrow and hear that I got pinned running from a cougar, only to be saved by you rushing in and staring him down. Um, yeah, that's pretty much how I remember it. Exactly why I'm going. To get my version out first. I laughed. Not a chance. But I will include the part about you throwing me to safety. The girls will love that. Especially Nicole. Daniel gripped the steering wheel, his gaze straight ahead. So it's still a no, then. I said. Look, if you aren't interested, I'll stop teasing you, but you did say she's cute. Yet. Yeah and it's been over a year. Not just a year since Serena's death, but a year since he'd gone on a date. That was starting to worry me. All I'm saying again is ask her if she's going to my party. 
Yes, obviously she is, and obviously, as the host, you're not asking her for a date, but it would just, open the possibility, you know. Let her know you might be interested, and see how things go. No pressure. We'll see. We pulled in the parking lot to see Corey talking to a girl who looked, from the back, like Sam. As we drove closer, though, I could see her dark hair was sleek, not spiked, and her clothes had colors, which meant they'd never be found in Sam's wardrobe. Then I caught a glimpse of her face and realized it was our elusive tree-climbing hiker. Corey waved us over. He said something to the woman and she turned, smiling. That smile evaporated when she saw us. Her gaze darted about, like she wanted to make another escape. She settled for pasting on a big, phony smile. Hey, guys, she said. Then, to me, does your dad still want that report, because I was super busy yesterday. I can try to squeeze it in today. That's okay, I said. He's got other problems right now. Another cougar, Daniel said to Corey. I saved her. A mountain lion. The woman cut in. What happened? This is Mina Lee, Corey said. She's a reporter doing a story on Salmon Creek. Cool, I said. What paper? It's an American one, she said, as if kids from Hicktown, Canada wouldn't recognize the name. We're doing a series on unusual small towns, and this one certainly qualifies. I'm particularly interested in getting the point of view of young people like you. Your opinion of this place must be a lot different from your parents. When we didn't react, she leaned forward, conspiratorial. It can't be easy living out here. Two hundred people, she shook her head. It must be so isolating. It is. Corey turned to Daniel. If there were more kids here, I wouldn't need to hang out with you. And we wouldn't need to hang out with girls. Even if they are hot girls, and, well, being such a small town, there's not a lot of competition for dates, so they're stuck with us and he looked at Mina. I like isolated. Mina studied us, trying to figure out if we were making fun of her. Honestly. Unless it was a rainy Saturday night and no one had wheels to drive into the city, we didn't mind living here. I could tell that wasn't what she wanted, though, so I played along. It can be a bit much, I said. No Starbucks. No clubs. No Aeropostale. We have to drive an hour just to hang out at the mall. Epic inconvenience. The guys struggled to keep straight faces as they nodded. And then there's the I lowered my voice medical research. Her eyes glinted. Bullseye. How do you feel about that, she said. Living with such secrecy and under such intense security. I mean, they built an entire town to hide their work. I worry that they're hurting bunnies, I said. We aren't supposed to talk about the medical stuff. Daniel looked around, mock anxious. We get in a lot of trouble for that. Mina nodded. I understand. But I'd love to chat. Privately. She set a time and place for us to meet her after school, then handed me her card and told us to bring along any other kids who wanted to talk. 8. As she walked away, Corey rubbed his temple, grimacing. Daniel glanced at him. You got your headache meds? Yes, Dad. I'll take one when I get inside. I handed him Mina's card. Your mom will want this. I texted her before you guys showed up. Even snapped a photo. She'll pass it on to Mayor Tilson and Dr. Inglis. Dr. Inglis was as much a part of town politics as Chief Carling and the mayor. Mina Lee wasn't the first reporter to come sniffing around Salmon Creek. From the time we were little, 
we'd been told how to deal with them. As far as we knew, no actual reporter had ever come to cover Salmon Creek. We might be an unusual little town, but we're definitely not worthy of a feature in an American newspaper. We were, however, worthy of attention from activists and competing medical companies. Over the years, we'd had a few activists posing as reporters, searching for evidence of animal testing or stem cell research. Of a bigger concern to the St. Clouds, though, were the corporate spies. Drug research is a huge business, with potentially huge profits. Imagine how much you could make if you developed a cure for cancer. Or even the common cold. The St. Clouds built Salmon Creek so they could develop new drugs without rivals peering over their shoulders. But that doesn't mean their rivals don't occasionally send spies to see what they're working on. Still, it doesn't take us long to sort out the troublemakers from the tourists. An alert about Mina Lee would go through Salmon Creek before lunch, shutting down all her potential sources of information. I told the guys I'd catch up with them later. I had to go in early and prep Mrs. Morris's classroom. No, I'm not a teacher's pet. There's a rule at our school that if you aren't on a sports team, you need to do extra work. Being temporarily off the track team meant I was on teacher helper duty two mornings a week. Watch out for Rafe, Corey said. I saw him in the smoking pit. Phony, I muttered. She thinks he's not a real smoker, Daniel explained. He's not. Half the time he doesn't light his cigarette. The other half he takes a couple of puffs and puts it out. It's part of the bad boy package. Corey grinned. Been paying attention, have you? Maya always pays attention, Daniel said. She notices everything and has an opinion on it, which she's not afraid to share as frequently and as loudly as possible. Corey laughed. Watch it, I said as I walked away, or I'll share my opinions on what happened last night. Hey, yeah. Corey said. So what did happen? I left Daniel to explain and went around the school the back way, past the smoking pit. Yes, we had a smoking pit, which is completely weird for a private school owned by a medical company. Kids smoke, though. It's a given, and the more adults try to stop it, the more kids are determined to do it. So the school board designated a smoking pit right beside the furnace room, where the rumble makes it hard to talk. Then they enacted a town bylaw prohibiting the sale of cigarettes to anyone under 20. Of course, kids can get them elsewhere, but only the most determined bother. I was almost at the door when Rafe skirted a crowd of ninth graders and slid in beside me, unsmoked cigarette dangling from his hand. Yes. I had another wild encounter last night, I said as we walked toward the entrance. Really? That's not what you wanted to talk to me about. No. He only laughed and grabbed the door for me. We went through. He walked beside me, so close I could smell wood smoke on his jacket. I thought of warning him that there was a ban on campfires with the dry weather, but that sounded snotty. I'm sure he knew. I'm sure he didn't care. I tried to forget he was there. But I could smell the smoke on his jacket, hear the clomp of his boots in the empty hall, even hear him breathing. I could feel him there, too. That sounds weird. I don't know how else to describe it, though. I was just really, really aware that he was walking beside me. When we turned the corner, he veered so that his hand brushed mine, and I jerked away. You really don't like me, do you, he said. I don't know you well enough to say that. Easily fixed. What are you doing after school? I shook my head as I stopped at my locker. He leaned against the one beside it. I started my combination. I suspect I could spend every evening this week with you and I wouldn't know you any better than I do right now. Sure you would. Anything you want to know, 
I'll tell you. That's the key word, isn't it? What I want to know. Not necessarily the truth. His lips twitched with what looked like genuine amusement. Are you calling me a poser? I should be offended. You could prove me wrong. I stuffed my bag in, took out my binder, then gestured at the cigarette in his hand. Smoke that. In here? I think that's against the rules. Which shouldn't bother you at all, if you're the rebel you pretend to be. But that's not what I meant. We'll go outside. I just want to see you smoke the whole thing without coughing. Are you saying I don't smoke? His brows lifted, then he leaned down so close to my ear I could smell toothpaste. Maybe, as a guy who changes schools a lot, I've discovered that the best place to meet kids is a smoking pit. I paused, hand still on my lock, thrown by his honesty. His grin sparked and I knew that was exactly the point. I snapped the lock shut and headed for the classroom. He fell in step beside me. So, what are you doing after school, he asked. You don't give up, do you? Nope, so you might as well surrender now. And that's exactly what will make you back off, isn't it? He arched his brows, as if he had no idea what I was talking about. You like the chase, I said. But once you get a girl, you back off before you can collect the prize. Kind of missing the point, I think. Hey. You're right. Tell you what, go out with me and you can show me how it's done. I'd walked right into that. I headed to the empty classroom, set my books on my desk, and opened the blinds for Mrs. Morris. Rafe sat on the edge of a desk. You're right. I chase hard, but once I get to know a girl, I realize she's not right for me. He met my gaze, his eyes earnest and soulful. I guess I haven't found the one I'm looking for. I sputtered a laugh. And you think I might be it? The girl you've been yearning for? Dreaming of? Your soul mate? I laughed even harder and shook my head. Please tell me that line doesn't actually work on. Raphael, said a voice from the door. I should have known. Cornering girls in classrooms so they can't run away. Desperate. And kind of pathetic. As Sam walked in, every trace of good humor drained from Rafe's face. The look he gave her sent a chill through me. And I don't chill easily. I'm talking to Maya he said, his voice so low it was almost a growl. Um, no, you're stalking her. His whole body went rigid at that. His gaze flitted my way. We were just talking, I said. I didn't mean to defend him, but there was something about the way Sam lobbed her insults that got my back up. Well, I need to talk to you now, so, she flicked her fingers at Rafe. Shoo. I saw a bunch of 8th graders outside. They're probably more your speed. Rafe looked at me. Is she harassing you? Sam choked on a laugh. Me? Seriously? Dude, you're the one doing the harassing, and I'd suggest you give it a rest before Daniel rips you a new one. Which would be fun to watch but I'd hate to see him get into trouble for taking out trash like. Okay, I said, lifting my hands. Enough. Rafe? I'm fine. I need to talk to Sam. I'll see you in class. As he left, Rafe shot Sam the kind of look you'd give a rabid dog. What had she done to him? Maybe she'd spooked him with her crazy routine only he didn't look spooked. While I cleaned the board, Sam settled onto a desk and stomped her boots on the chair, dirt showering the seat. What a freaking loser. What's up, Sam? I saw you guys talking to a woman in the parking lot. Nicole said she's a reporter, asking questions about us. How we all got here, 
if any of us weren't born here. Nick says she's really interested in the ones that weren't. You, me, Rafe. Probably hoping we'll be less attached to the town and more likely to spill secrets. Why? Do you have outstanding assault warrants somewhere? Haha. <laughs> Actually, it wouldn't surprise me at all if Sam had a juvie record. She was even quicker with her fists than Daniel and, unlike him, she didn't try to hold back. So did she say anything to you? Sam asked. About you. About any of us. The ones who weren't born here. Which wasn't what she meant at all. I could tell by the way her gaze shifted to the left. I walked over and lowered my voice. Are you in trouble, Sam? What? She slid off the desk. No. God, I can't even make an innocent comment without you jumping to conclusions. If you start telling people this chick is after me. You don't need to threaten me, Sam, because you know I don't spread stories. Chief Carling has already been told about this woman, so you won't need to worry about her much longer anyway. She looked alarmed. Corey called his mom. Um, yet. Yeah. Standard procedure for anyone poking around, which you'd know if you didn't sit through every assembly with your iPod blasting. The bell sounded, and I moved to my desk by the window. I'm sure they'll call another assembly today, and tell us how to handle it, again. When Sam reached her desk at the back, she hesitated, then said, about Rafe. I'm sure you're just being nice, but be careful. Did he do something? Not yet, but he's trouble. Some girls go for that. You're not one of them. You're smart. Just, stay smart, okay. I nodded. Then the door banged open, and kids streamed in. Nine. I was right about the assembly. It came during last period. Really, you'd think by now. The town could trust us older kids enough to just say, Hey, there's one of those fake reporters in town. Here's her picture. You know the drill. But apparently, under the age of 18, our memories have short expiration periods. If there's anything worse than being confined to a small auditorium with everyone in the school, it's being confined there at the end of the day, when I'm desperate for fresh air and open skies. The crush of bodies, their stifling heat, the smell of them as deodorant began wearing off, even the sound of everyone breathing and coughing. Go, Daniel whispered at the halfway mark. Anything new, I'll fill you in. As I passed Mrs. Morris, I motioned that I was going out to use the washroom. I'm sure she knew better, but she just smiled and waved me on. We aren't a school with a truancy problem. Let's be honest, where would you go if you skipped class? No mall. No coffee shop. No hangout where the person running the place hasn't known you from childhood, and knows you should be in class. The school is on the edge of town. Most of the town is on the edge of town you can't walk far in any direction without ending up in the forest. That's where I went. As I started along the path. I noticed a young, dark-haired woman. But not Mina Lee. This one was taller than me, with long black hair that curled over her faded denim jacket. Native or Latina. She was watching me and making no effort to hide it. Mina Lee's partner? If so, she needed lessons in subtlety even more than Mina did. When I headed her way, she started grinning and rocking on her toes like she was fighting an urge to run toward me. She looked about 19, but her grin belonged on the face of a five-year-old. She was bouncing like a five-year-old, too. When I got a better look at her face high cheekbones, sharp nose and chin, and slightly slanted amber eyes I realized this had to be Rafe's older sister. I'd never seen her before. Few people in town had. She was supposed to be an artist.
shy and reclusive, Rafe had told everyone. One look at this girl, so eager to say hello she could barely stand still, and I knew that was a lie. Surprise, surprise. Hello, I said. She launched herself at me so fast I didn't have time to get out of the way before she had her arms around my neck, hugging me like a long-lost sister. Um, hi, I said, giving her a quick hug back, then stepping away. I shouldn't do that, right? Sorry. I couldn't help it. I've been waiting so long. She resumed bouncing on her toes. I'm so happy to meet you. I'm, happy to meet you, too. I'm Maya. I know. I'm Annie. She bounced there, grinning and staring at me. Her eyes were wide and childlike, and as I looked in them, I had a pretty good idea why Rafe was keeping his sister a secret. She was. I guess mentally challenged is the right term. Rafe's right. You are pretty. I like your hair. She reached out and stroked a lock hanging over my shoulder. I wish mine was straight. I used to straighten it, but it never really worked. I don't think I was doing it right. Rafe tried to help, but she giggled. He's not a good hairdresser. I couldn't help smiling at that image. So you live in the Skylark Cottage? I said. That must get lonely. Sometimes. But it's okay. There's so much forest to run in. She closed her eyes and lifted her face to the sun, her smile rapturous. It's wonderful. You like the forest? I asked. She opened her eyes and they shone with a light that made her beautiful. I love the forest. Me, too. She laughed. Of course you do, silly. It's in our blood. I guessed she meant native blood. Like with Rafe, I couldn't really tell her heritage, but I supposed that answered my question. I was going to ask what tribe she was, when her eyes went wide. Oh. I'm in trouble now, she said. I followed her gaze to the back door. Rafe was bearing down on us, his expression set somewhere between annoyance and anxiety. I'm going to get a stern talking to, Annie whispered, her tone saying she wasn't the least bit concerned by the prospect. When Rafe got within ten feet, she launched herself at him the same way she had with me. Instead of hugging him, she grabbed him in a headlock and ruffled his hair. I didn't break the rules, she said as she danced away. She came over to me, and she talked to me first. She's right, I said. Okay, just, he took her gently by the wrist. We have to go, Annie. Say goodbye to Maya. She doesn't need to, I began. Yes, she does. He led Annie off before I could argue. I glowered at his retreating back. Was he embarrassed by Annie? All the hairstyling in the world wouldn't make him a decent brother if he forced her to stay locked in a cabin all day. Maybe that was how he'd been raised, but the next time he came sniffing around, we were definitely having a chat about this. As I stormed back toward the school, I heard running footsteps behind me. Maya. Rafe called. Hold up a section. Seems we were having that chat sooner than I expected. I need to ask you a favor, he said. I nodded to open my mouth. Don't tell anyone about Annie, okay? Please? You saw well, you saw she's got some problems, and I'd really appreciate it if... If I let you keep your mentally challenged sister a secret? Kept her from wrecking your street cred? God, you're a piece of work, Rafael Martinez. I thought Sam was being harsh on you this morning, but she wasn't nearly harsh enough. As I ranted, his face hardened. By the time I finished, it was like granite, his eyes cold chunks of amber. Are you done? he asked 
voice as frosty as his eyes. No, I haven't even begun. I was planning to talk to you later, offer to take Annie to lunch, let her meet people, but obviously that's not going to work, so I'll move straight to step two. Talk to my parents. I walked away before I could see his reaction. He called after me, How old am I, Maya? I turned. How should I know? Whatever you've told the school, I'm sure it's a lie anyway. I'm sixteen, just like you. Or like you will be tomorrow, from what I heard. My birthday was last month. Congratulations. I started walking again. I'll send you a card next year, if you hang around that long, which I doubt. You don't need to doubt it. I'll be leaving for sure if you tell anyone about Annie. I wheeled. Are you threatening to take her? Legally, I can't take her anywhere. I'm 16, Maya. Barely 16. She's 19. Who's the guardian here? I paused, then said, softly, Oh. Yeah, oh. Annie and I never knew our dad. Our mom died last year when Annie was 18. Before the accident. So she got custody of me. Accident? It's brain damage. The look in Rafe's eyes, the grief. It hurt just to see it, and he turned away fast, mumbling, yet. Yeah. It's brain damage. Point is that if anyone finds out, I'm off to a foster home and she's off to an institution. Which neither of us wants. I stepped toward him. I'm sorry. I just, jumped to conclusions. Big surprise. I'm sorry. He turned back and ran his hand through his hair. Yeah, well, I know it looked bad. It is bad. I definitely don't want her living like this. The school thinks I'm 17, with my birthday early next year, so at worst, we'd have to wait that long. I didn't know what to say to that. It was like when he admitted why he pretended to smoke his honesty through me. This time, though, he didn't seem to be trying to win points, which threw me all the more. He was trusting me with things I hadn't earned his trust for, which only made me realize he didn't have anyone he could trust with stuff like that, not in Salmon Creek, and I felt bad for him, which I was sure he wouldn't want. I meant what I said, I said finally about spending time with Annie. Not in town obviously, but maybe we can go for a walk or whatever. She said she likes the forest. I could show her stuff. She'd like that. He looked over at me. Thanks. My cheeks heated. I looked away and mumbled, sure. Then I asked, are you coming to the party tomorrow, because it was, at the moment, the only change of subject I could come up with. Daniel's party. Rafe looked confused, as if he couldn't imagine why I'd think he was going to the party of a guy who obviously didn't like him. Well, it's at Daniel's place, but it's really. Your birthday party. I know. He kept giving me that look, and I didn't blame him I was as unlikely to invite him as Daniel was. Everyone goes, I said. The whole class. Yeah, I know. Haley asked if I was going, but I kind of figured that didn't exactly count as an invitation. Unless I went with her, which I'd really rather not. I had to laugh at his expression. Don't blame you. But you can now consider yourself officially invited by the birthday girl. It's an easier way to meet people than hanging out at the smoking pit. Healthier, too. That got a smile from him. Not that lazy grin I'd seen so often, but something as different from his usual self as that ice-cold anger I'd seen him show to Sam and, later, to me. A crooked smile. Hesitant. Not quite shy, 
but close enough to do more to my insides than that one he tossed around so casually. When I felt that, I felt a faint pang of panic, too something in my gut that said falling for Rafe Martinez was a bad idea. When he said, I'll see, in a tone that said he wasn't likely to show up, I was relieved. It depends on Annie, he said. It's Saturday, so she'll expect me to stick around. Understandable, I said. Have a good weekend, then, and I'll see you Monday. I hurried off before he could reply. Ten. So, no tattoo yet, I said as I sat on the rock, legs dangling over the edge. Mom wants to take me to Vancouver for the weekend but... That was our plan. I don't want to do it without you. I couldn't say that, not even sitting here alone, talking to the lake, pretending Serena was still here, still swimming, still singing, forever swimming and singing. I hardly ever came to the lake anymore. When I did, it was to talk to her, which seems weird, since this is the place she died. But it was the place she loved best, too and if I sat very still and closed my eyes, I could hear her laughing, hear her singing. Her voice haunted this place even more than her memory, and usually I couldn't take the reminder. But this was a special day, my 16th birthday, when we should have been in Vancouver, getting tattoos to let us drive the car, then sneaking out at night to flirt with college guys. Mom still feels bad about what happened at the tattoo site, I said. I wish she hadn't. I just want to forget about it. I hugged my knees to my chest. It's weird, isn't it? That it's bothering me. Since when do I care what other people think? I do, I think. But you always knew that. I shifted again, the rock cold under me. It's like this splinter that won't come out, and I keep picking at it and it only gets worse. Then there are the dreams. I had them last night again. I don't want to tell mom and dad, because they'll hike me back to Dr. Fodor, and he'll say it's post-traumatic stress, that seeing Daniel with that cougar brought it on again. What's the point of talking to a therapist if I know what he'll say? I caught a faint whiff of smoke on the breeze. Campers? I'd have to mention that to dad so he could find and warn them. The distraction helped and I stretched out again, reclining on the rock as the sun reappeared. I got my birthday presents this morning, I continued. Mom did a blueprint for a treehouse for Fitz. I smiled, imagining her laugh. Seriously. It's got this set of ramps, so he can climb up, then walk down. Only problem will be building it. We'll need to wait for Walter to come back next spring. Walter was Dad's seasonal helper and the town carpenter. Dad's taking me into town this week to get my learner's permit. He says he's due for a new Jeep next year, so when I get my novice, he's going to buy the old one from the St. Clouds, which means I'll be able to drive Daniel to school. He'll love that, won't he? I laughed but it trailed off into silence. After a moment, I said, he's doing well. Daniel. He got back on track faster than I did, I was going to say, then realized that didn't sound good. Serena wouldn't want him moping around, but she wouldn't want to think he'd forgotten her already, so I said, he's still not dating. I think he should try but, I shrugged. He will when he's ready. I flipped onto my stomach and looked down at the still water. Speaking of Daniel and my birthday, he's up to something. I texted him this morning, asking if he wanted me to come over and help get the place ready, and he said no, it was under control. I imagined her answer and laughed. Yeah, definitely up to something if he's turning down cleaning help. Better not be pranking me because he knows I'll give as good as I get and... Maya. I scrambled up as a figure appeared at the edge of the woods. Nicole. 
I waved and she stepped through into the clearing, gym bag slung over her arm. Please don't tell me you are going swimming today, I said. She blushed. I know, I practice too much. Um, no. I mean swimming, in a lake, in October. It's not that cold. And the pool we're going to next month is always freezing, so I thought it'd be good for me. But now that you mention it, she gazed out over the lake and shivered. Uh-huh, I said, and we both laughed. I heard you talking, she said as she came closer. Who's up there? She stopped as she realized I was alone. Then she looked at the lake and her cheeks colored. Oh. I I am sorry. I'll just, um. I'll see you tonight. Hold up, I said as I scrambled off the rock. I was just leaving. My mom will have lunch ready soon. Join us. There's always lots. I caught up and we walked in awkward silence for a minute before she said, Daniel asked me to the party this morning. When I glanced over, she blushed again. I mean, obviously, I was invited. But he called to make sure I was coming, and I thought maybe he wanted help, but he said he was with the guys today, so I thought, you know, he was just making sure or something. Another bright flush. It probably doesn't mean anything, but it was nice. I nodded. He said he might ask you. Her face glowed, and I felt a little guilty. Mom says I shouldn't play matchmaker. If it's going to happen, it's going to happen. But if I can help make things happen whether it's getting a couple together or organizing a fundraiser or being captain of the track team then I don't see the point in sitting back and doing nothing. I thought Nicole would be a good fit for Daniel. Not a love of his life match, but someone who could help him get back into dating, someone who really liked him and would be happy just to hang out with him, take things at his pace, understand if it didn't work out. I hear you invited someone, too, she said. Hey. She grinned and elbowed me. Forgotten already? I met Rafe in the store last night and asked if he was going tonight and he said that you invited him. I opened my mouth to say it wasn't like that, then shut it. If Rafe said I invited him, then he wasn't lying. No more than I'd been when I said Daniel had considered asking Nicole. It just wasn't the way it sounded. I told Daniel about it when he called, Nicole said. I was just going to razz him about it, but he seemed surprised. That was putting it mildly, I was sure. I should have mentioned it I just hadn't figured Rafe would take me up on the offer. He probably still wouldn't, but I should have told Daniel anyway. Daniel's fine with it, she continued. You know how he is. If you're cool with it, he is, too. She kicked a tree branch off the path. Anyway, Rafe's not so bad. Haley doesn't think so anyway. She oh. When she hesitated, I said, what is it? Just, well, if you're going with Rafe, and Haley finds out I knew about it, a deep breath. I'll have to tell her. She'll be really mad if I don't. Another pause. And she'll be really mad if I say you invited him. Which has nothing to do with you. I know but... Maybe I just won't tell her. Fair or not, Haley would take it out on Nicole. If any of the kids had a problem with small town life, it was Haley. You can't be a convincing mean girl without an entourage. Stuck with a meager selection, she'd decided to convert Nicole. I hated how she treated her best friends one day, ordering her around the next. Nicole didn't seem to like it either but with Serena gone, I guess she'd decided Haley would have to do, since I didn't seem to be interested. I looked out at the lake. I could use a girlfriend. A real one I could talk to, not just someone to hang out with. 
how could I push Daniel to replace Serena in his life when I wasn't ready to? When would I be ready to? I didn't know. Just not yet. Nicole came to my place for lunch, then we hung out, but it was awkward. I was used to being with her as part of a group, and it wasn't long before she remembered a singing lesson, and I spent the rest of the afternoon with my animals. When Dad took me to the party that evening, I still hadn't shaken my mood. If anything, it gotten worse. I couldn't stop thinking about Serena. Couldn't stop thinking this was my second birthday without her. The first party, though. She'd died at the end of August and even by October, I hadn't been ready for a party without her. Now I realized I still wasn't. We were halfway down the wooded road to Daniel's place when Dad pulled over to the side. You don't look like a girl heading to her 16th birthday party, he said. It'll pass. I'm just... Serena. I nodded. My eyes filled and I pushed my palms against them. Great. I knew I should have bought the waterproof mascara. Dad pressed a tissue into my hand. I carefully wiped my eyes, then flipped down the visor mirror. You look beautiful, he said. You're parentally obligated to say that. True. I made a face at him, then adjusted my seat belt, and said, Carry on, Jeeves. Jeeves is a valet, not a chauffeur. We can't afford both, so you're stuck with double duty. He stopped in front of the house. The windows were dark. Oh, please, I said. Not the surprise party thing again. Better work on your surprised face. I opened the door. No final words of warning. I trust you. I sighed. That'll be my epitaph someday. So trustworthy. So honest. So boring. I headed up the walk. Like all the houses in Salmon Creek, the Bianchi home is owned by the St. Clouds. This one is two stories with four bedrooms, one for Daniel's parents and one for each child. No matter what your job is, your house is just big enough to fit your family comfortably. They're all nice, though, not cookie-cutter military base houses. The Bianchi place is modern Victorian with gabled windows and a big front porch that cries out for a swing. Yet there's no swing. Never has been. The front door was locked. All part of the show, given that I knew where the key was. I unlocked it and let myself in. Oh my, no one's here, I called. Could I have the wrong day? Maybe they all went someplace else to party without me. Silence. I walked into the living room. When no one jumped out and yelled surprise. I started to get concerned. I wandered through the empty, silent house, finally ending up in the dining room where brightly wrapped gifts were piled on the table. Okay, guys, so where are you? I noticed something on top of the pile. A papaya. I groaned. That was my classmate's old nickname for me. Maya Papaya. Original, I know. There was an arrow carved in the papaya, pointing to the screen door. Follow the papayas, I muttered, shaking my head. Guys, guys, guys. I headed for the door. Eleven. I found another papaya in the middle of the yard, pointing to the path leading into the forest. As I walked, I alternated between looking for papayas on the ground and for classmates overhead. Given how many times I'd jumped out of trees or off rocks and scared the crap out of my friends, I figured payback might be coming. But there was no sign of anyone just papayas, a half dozen of them leading me along the path. Then I stepped out into the clearing at the base of a rock face that rose 50 feet in the air. I'd seen this particular cliff many times, but today it was different. Today it had toeholds and cuts carved out and stone protrusions drilled on. 
A belay and pulley hung from the top. Oh my god, I whispered. Happy birthday, Maya, a voice said behind me. I turned as Daniel stepped from the trees. You like, he said. I ran over and threw my arms around his neck. I think that's a yes, Corey said, off to my left. Hey, we helped, too. That was Brendan Hajak, the veterinarian's son, who'd become captain of the track team after I'd bowed out last year. He was Daniel's height and slender with light brown hair worn to his shoulders, usually tied back, like it was today. There'd been a time when he'd asked me to school dances, and whenever he did, I was really tempted to say yes despite my rule against dating town boys. Brendan was quiet and sweet, and between track and a love of animals we had a lot in common. But I had my summer boy rule for a reason I wouldn't risk my friendships by dating my friends. Eventually, he'd stopped asking. Now he was dating a girl a few towns over. I gave both Corey and Brendan a hug, which I think shocked out of them, but neither complained. The others streamed out of the forest. Even Haley had come with her younger sister, Brooke, and Brooke's boyfriend. Like I said, Haley and I don't get along. I like Brooke, though. It's not her fault. I said a quick hello to everyone, then hurried to the climbing wall and stared up, barely resisting the urge to start jumping up and down, screaming like a game show winner. You always said this rock face would be perfect for climbing, Daniel said as he walked up behind me. If only it had more cracks and crevices, I said. And now it does. I grinned up at him until Nicole grabbed my arm and said, come and try it out. As she pulled me away, I glanced back at Daniel. How long did it take to build? Too long, Brendan said. And we weren't even around for most of it. We've been at it since six this morning, finishing up, Corey said. So we'd really appreciate it if you girls could grab us some cold beers. Are you going to show us how it's done, Maya? Brooke said. I'll never make it all the way up, but I'd love to try. I'm sure Haley would, too. Um, no, Haley said. She turned to me. I can't believe you still do stuff like this. Are you ever going to grow up? I still do it, Corey said. Because you're a guy. Girls don't climb walls. Not real girls, anyway. Just tomboys whose closets are filled with tank tops and jeans and sneakers. Who still consider braids and ponytails high fashion. Who wouldn't know how to apply makeup on a dare. Knock it off, Haley, Daniel said. I was wearing makeup. Just not a lot. I had my hair down, too, and although I was wearing jeans, they were my fancy ones, paired with a new fitted tee and ankle boots. It might have been the t-shirt slogan that she objected to brunette as the new blonde but I didn't buy it to set her off. Am I the only one around here who thinks Maya has a hidden Y chromosome? Haley said. If she does, she's hiding it pretty good, Corey said giving me a lascivious once-over. Haley scowled at me and opened her mouth to say something else. Daniel started to cut her off, but Corey beat him to it. Lessons later, he said. First, we need to see if this girl is as good a climber as she thinks she is. Challenge time. A race to the top. Maya versus anyone who dares take her on. That'll be a short list. I said. Corey grinned. Not when they hear the prize. He turned to the others. Anyone who beats our sweet sixteen gets to kiss her. The lineup forms behind me. Brendan got behind him. Daniel grinned at me and joined. The other guys filed in. Oh my god, I said. What are you guys? Twelve? No. Brendan said. Just really, really immature. 
In other words, typical guys, said a voice. Sam stepped out from behind Haley and Brooke and cut in line behind Daniel. I'll skip the kiss, she said. But as the designated bad girl, I can't resist the urge to show up the good girl. So what do I get when I beat everyone? I said. When? Corey shook his head. Do you need a wide load sign for transporting that ego? Fine. Beat all of us and I'll kiss you. Speaking of egos. Beat us and we'll install more holds over there. Daniel pointed to a tougher and higher section of the rock face ten feet down, then looked at me. How's that? I smiled. Game on. Nicole and Brooke took the path up to the top, so they could referee. Haley stayed at the bottom. Between the natural crevices and bumps, and the newly installed ones, there were more than enough for two people to climb side by side. Corey went first. I beat him easily. Brendan was a little tougher, but I still made it to the top before he was much past the halfway mark. Neither had any real climbing experience they just counted on their general athletic prowess to pull them through. Next up was the only real threat. Daniel. He'd been climbing with me for years. I was the natural I was faster and more agile but he had double my upper body strength and that counts for a lot. Daniel did a test run first. Brendan and Corey complained about that, but he was right I'd gone up twice now, which gave me an advantage. If I was going to win, I wanted to do it fairly. Daniel belayed back down as I got into position. His feet hit the ground with a thump, then he looked over at me. Ready. Always. Nicole did the countdown from the top. I started fast, reaching the halfway mark head and shoulders above him. But that's when things got tricky, the holds and grips a little farther apart, and he had the advantage. By the three-quarter mark, he'd caught up. Better kick it up a notch, he said, as he drew alongside me. I know you really want those extra holds. And I'm sure you really don't want to make them. But don't forget the second part. You win, you gotta kiss me. Might be better to stick with the holds. He laughed and heaved up to the next grip, pulling away now. I grabbed another and found toe holds first shooting a couple inches above him, the advantage lost a second later when his longer arms found the next grips as I was still getting leverage. I kept my face forward now, climbing in earnest for the first time since we'd started. A hiss and boo from below told me I was in the lead. Then a grunt from beside me. A sharp intake of breath and I knew he was pulling up. The crowd cheered. I looked up to see Brooke leaning over the side, ropes in hand, urging me on. Only three feet to go. I could see Daniel out of the corner of my eye, his chin level with my nose, just a scant inch advantage, but I knew it was enough and as soon as he grabbed that top ledge and heaved himself up. A grunt. Daniel wobbled and the grip slid out of his hand. He dropped only a few inches but by the time he'd recovered, I was pulling myself over the top. Brooke and Nicole were cheering. The others below called up good-natured boos. I took a breather as I hung off the ledge. I could hear Daniel panting beside me, but I didn't look over. There was no way he'd lost his hold on that grip. He'd let go. Given me the win at the last second as he realized what was coming if he'd won. A kiss he didn't want. The ego bruise lasted only a moment. Was I surprised? No. How awkward would that have been? Neither of us wanted that kiss. As always, Daniel had done the right thing and, if I'd been in his place, I'd have done the same. After a moment, I grinned over at him. Loser. The rope slipped, he said, tugging at it like he was testing the belay system. You just keep telling yourself that. 
It'll keep you busy while you're building those new holds. You still need to beat everyone else. You haven't won yet. Just keep telling yourself that, too. He laughed and gave me a shove. I returned the favor, sending him swinging, then belayed down before he could retaliate. The next challenger was Sam. She was strong enough to climb and obviously had some experience, just not enough to give her a serious shot at victory. She took the defeat well, though, just teasing me in a surprisingly good mood. The other guys were easy wins. Everyone was joking about a rematch with Daniel and ribbing the guys about losing a kiss and gaining a weekend of work, when a familiar voice drawled, Is the game over? Or is there room for one more? 12. Rafe walked out of the forest. The leather jacket was gone, replaced by a tattered denim one. Instead of boots, he wore sneakers that looked as old as the jacket. As he walked toward us, his gaze was fixed on me like he didn't notice anyone else there. You're late, I said. Yeah, had some trouble getting away. Then I figured I was at the wrong place until I saw the gifts and followed the papayas. He stopped in front of me and smiled his real smile, the crooked one that made my breath flutter. To my left, Daniel rocked forward. He didn't say anything, just stayed poised like that, watching for trouble. Rafe didn't seem to notice. His gaze stayed locked on mine, crooked smile fainter now but his eyes still shimmering. So did I hear right, he said. Race to the top? Winner gets a kiss. Maya's done seven climbs in a row, Daniel said. You can race me. But I don't want to kiss you. The others laughed. Rafe didn't even look at Daniel when he answered, just kept watching me with a smile that now held a hint of challenge. If she says no, she forfeits the new grips, Corey said. She had to defeat all comers. That was the deal. I'm the one who offered, Daniel said. So it stands as is. He's late. I am. So it's up to Maya. She's already won. I'm just the bonus round. He grinned then, but it was a different kind of grin a mock arrogance that made me laugh and shake my head. I looked into his eyes and saw the challenge sparkling there, and I hadn't even decided what to do when I heard myself saying, You're on. As Rafe walked over to the dangling harness, he stripped off his jacket, earning him giggles and whispers from the girls and grunts from the guys, who weren't nearly as impressed. Rafe skipped Jim whenever he could, so I'd assumed he wasn't the athletic type. I was wrong. He wore an old t-shirt with the sleeves torn off, and his lean muscles moved under coppery skin. He had a tattoo on the inside of his forearm a small one that looked like raven wings. When he turned around, I caught the faint edge of another tattoo on his shoulder peeking from under his shirt. He glanced over, like he'd sensed me looking. When I didn't turn away, he grinned and mouthed something I didn't catch probably didn't want to. Brendan helped Rafe into the harness. It took a while, the process punctuated by Rafe's questions. Then he stood at the base of the rock face, saying, You put your toes here, right? And you grab those things that stick out. The others laughed and yelled, Quit while you're ahead. Daniel relaxed and rolled his eyes at me. I rolled mine back but not for the same reason. When we were finally in position, the others pulling away, I whispered, Poser. Rafe glanced over, brows arching. Keep calling me that and I might get insulted. Stop earning it and I'll stop saying it. I faced forward as I tested my rope and waited for Daniel to get to the top. Are you implying that I know how to climb? Are you implying that I'm stupid enough to think you'd challenge me if you didn't? Of course, you can't be that good if you need to slow me down by pretending you don't know what you're doing. He was about to shoot something back, 
when Daniel leaned over and called, Ready. Rafe motioned for him to wait a second, then whispered, How about we up the stakes? I win, you talk to me. Now it was my turn to raise my eyebrows. I'm afraid to ask what you mean by talk. Exactly that. I win, I get thirty minutes of your time tonight. To charm me and lie to me and pretend to be whoever you think I want. Nope. Tonight it's me, in case you haven't noticed. The real Rafe Martinez. A special one-night appearance. And if I win? He grinned. Then you get to spend thirty minutes with me, lucky birthday girl. I laughed and motioned for Daniel to start the countdown. Rafe still pulled the I don't know what I'm doing routine, starting slow and cautious, hoping I'd second guess my assessment and take it easy. I didn't. He realized that when my foot reached his shoulder level. By the midpoint, he'd shot up to my waist, but his muttered curses told me he'd underestimated how good I was or overestimated how good he was and it was clear he wasn't going to catch up in time. So I stopped. Daniel leaned over and mouthed, What are you doing? Below, the others yelled, a cacophony of shouts and cheers and jeers. Rafe reached up, his bracelet hitting the rock with a ping. I glanced at it. A worn rawhide band with a cat's eye stone. I could see his tattoo better, too, as he pulled himself up, and I recognized the symbol. A crow mother Kachina. Hopi. As he drew up alongside me, he cocked one brow. You really want that kiss don't you, he said. No, I just want to see what you can really do. He smiled then, a blaze of a grin that made me forget I was hanging twenty feet above the ground. All right then, he said. No holds barred. On my count. I nodded. One, two, three. We took off. I kept my face to the wall, throwing everything I had into the climb, certain I'd pull away to victory. But he stayed alongside me, his grunts and labored breathing telling me he was trying just as hard. I struggled to concentrate, but all I could hear was his breathing. It was weirdly relaxing, like the ticking of a metronome, and I found myself moving faster, smoother the rock seeming to glide under me, hands and feet finding the notches and grips automatically, like climbing a tree, that blissful feeling of going higher and higher, the earth and everything earthly vanishing below me, the air getting thinner, the world quieter as I pulled away until my hand hit the top ledge and I jolted out of it, and looked over to see Rafe beside me, sweat dripping down his face, eyes glowing, face glowing, his gaze locked on mine again, lips parting to say something. A jerk on my harness made me look up sharply as Daniel adjusted the rope, preparing to let me belay down. The look on his face told me who'd won. I said. Seriously. By a fingertip, Rafe said. You need to grow longer arms. Before we'd even hit the ground, the others crowded around, asking who'd won. I waited for Rafe to claim the victory. He didn't. So I told them. Because she let you catch up, Sam said. I wouldn't count that as a win. Which is why I didn't say I won, Rafe said, as he undid his harness. Still counts, Corey said. Give the guy some room so he can collect his prize. Daniel rounded the bend in the path, picking up speed like he was coming to rescue me from my obligation. When he caught my eye, he slowed. Rafe shucked his harness and took mine. He set them aside and I braced myself, but he only called over to Daniel, that's an amazing wall. Sometime I'd love to know how you did it. Daniel nodded, still watching Rafe warily. Um, your prize, Corey said. If you aren't going to take it, I'd be happy to play stand-in. I'll collect it later, Rafe said. Without an audience. Uh-uh, 
Corey said. No rain checks. Rafe only shrugged. I can ask for one. If Maya doesn't want to honor it, that's her choice. Daniel grunted and collected the gear. He didn't say anything, but I knew Rafe had scored a point. Sam strolled over from where she'd been standing at the back of the group, gaze fixed on Rafe like a mugger spotting an easy mark. He stiffened. Being the sort who doesn't find brawls an entertaining addition to her birthday parties, I decided action was needed. Sam wasn't here to help me celebrate my big day. She wanted something, and if she got it, she'd be less likely to pick a fight. So, guys, I said. Since I've been doing the family thing today, I haven't heard what happened with that fake reporter chick. Anyone spoken to her since yesterday? I did, Brendan said. I was walking home after school, cutting through the forest after I split with Corey, and she just happened to be taking the same path. Following me, I think. Anyway, she wanted to talk. So I did. You're not supposed to, Brooke said. You know that. Brendan gave her a look. I'm a big boy. And she was kind of cute, Corey said, elbowing him. No, but I wanted to get a better handle on her game. Good idea, Daniel said. He waved for us to start back to the house and for Brendan to keep talking. All she wanted to talk about was us the high school kids. She kept saying she was working on an article and wanted to slant it that way, what life is like for teens in Salmon Creek. She asked a lot about the extracurricular stuff, which was weird. Like what? I asked. Which sports we did? Which clubs we had? Why we had those ones? Who was on each team? She took notes for that part dividing us up by what activities we were in. Looking for cliques, I said. Trying to make us sound as if we're just like the kids in city schools. You have your choir girls and your wrestling guys. I guess so. After that, she started asking about the medical stuff. I hope you shut your mouth, Brooke said. Yes, but the questions she was asking were weird. About us again. How often did we get checked out? Did we get any special shots? Were we on special diets? Oh my god, I whispered. We're lab rats. They're experimenting on us. Building super wrestlers and singers who can take over the WWE and American Idol. The first steps to world domination. I think that'd be Canadian Wrestling Entertainment and Canadian Idol, Daniel said. Okay the first very, very small step toward world domination. And that's exactly what you two can tell her, Brendan said. She was asking who I'd pick for class leaders. He finger quoted the phrase. I was about to tell the truth and say that'd be me, but then I realized she was looking for someone to pester with more questions, so I nominated you guys. Thanks. I glanced at Sam who was following the conversation with obvious frustration. Did she single out anyone in particular? Not to speak to but just in general. Well, she asked about Serena and... Serena. I said, Sam forgotten. What about her? Brendan glanced at Daniel. Um, nothing specific. Just reporter stuff. You know. Anyway, then she asked. Was she interested in Serena's death? I said. Could that be what she's investigating? Course not. I mean, maybe as a side story, but umm. He glanced at Daniel again and when I turned, Daniel's face was averted, but I knew what had passed between them. A look from Daniel warning Brendan to the subject before I was in no mood to enjoy my party. He was right, of course. My heart was already pounding double time. I took a deep breath. 
Did she ask about anyone else? Oh, everyone, Brendan said, rushing on. Names, friendships, hobbies. She was really interested in our hobbies. When we talked about the teams and stuff, she asked why Rafe and Sam aren't on any. I said Rafe just moved here, and I don't know what he's into. And me. Sam said. I said you're antisocial. Thanks. She asked whether you were good at any of the school's specialties singing, track, swimming, wrestling. I said all I know is you like to hit people. She flipped him the finger. What? It's true. Then she asked if they let girls on the boxing team and I said Mr. Barnes tried to get you on it, but you weren't interested. Then get this she starts asking if you've got a hate on for certain people. Sam looked worried, almost alarmed, but when she saw me watching, she tried to hide it and said, So what did you tell her? That you're an equal opportunity hater. You pick on all of us. Except Daniel. I think you're sweet on Daniel. Sam punched Brendan in the side. She made it look like a play punch, but I heard it connect, and he gasped. Anything else? I asked. That's when she started in on the medical stuff and I said I had to leave, Brendan said, still sounding a little winded. So, Rafe, you gonna join us on the track team? You're in good shape and, without Maya this fall, we're short a member. Rafe glanced over with AHMM. He'd been walking beside me but had tuned out the conversation, gaze drifting over the forest fingers tapping his leg, like he was bored already. When Brendan repeated the question, he shrugged and said, Not really my thing. You have to join something, Haley said. They're just cutting you some slack because you're new. How about swimming? That got a chuckle. Definitely not my thing. Conversation turned to the swimming team and an upcoming meet and Rafe's gaze returned to the forest, like he was looking for an escape route. I eased over, close enough to murmur, go on. Hmm. This obviously isn't your thing either. I slowed to let the others get ahead. You showed up. Good enough. Go on. Enjoy the rest of your night. Trying to get rid of me. He managed a smile that barely touched his eyes. Or trying to get out of our deal. I won 30 minutes of your time, remember. You can have a rain check on that, too. He searched my face. Are you mad because I didn't take the kiss? It wasn't an insult. I have every intention of cashing that check. Just not with all your friends watching. I appreciate that. Yet. Another searching look. Then he smiled. Good. Doesn't mean I'll accept the chip when you cash it. But you scored points for chivalry. Yet. I nodded. Haley was very impressed. He laughed. Just what I need. Did I hear someone say my name? Haley said, slipping over between us. That was Rafe. I said, as we headed into the yard. He said you're just what he. Rafe coughed, covering the rest. I grinned and jogged to catch up with the others. Thirteen. By the time we got inside, Rafe had done a disappearing act. I thought maybe he was just getting away from Haley, but he didn't show up for pizza or gift opening or the obligatory cake ceremony. I should have been relieved. I'd given him permission to leave. I didn't want anything to do with the guy, right? Maybe that was true yesterday, maybe it even been true this morning, when Nicole said he might be coming. But now, when he actually took off, what I felt was anything but relief. Still, I wasn't letting that spoil my party. The pizza was great. The gifts were good if you exclude the dollar store dream catcher from Haley. 
I got books and silver jewelry and funky t-shirts. Corey and Brendan had helped build the wall, of course. The materials and the equipment came from Daniel, meaning I needed to start thinking of an amazing gift for him next year. After cake, we sat around the kitchen, talking. That's when the kids who weren't part of our circle drifted off for the night. Once they were gone, Corey brought out the booze. Well, a twelve-pack of beer. That's Daniel's house rule. One pack of Lucky and when it's gone, it's gone. No one drove to the party, so no one would be driving home. And because it was Daniel setting the rules, no one broke them. No one dared. When we party with summer kids, the new cottage renters sometimes joke about hiding the booze from me. I'm native, so I must drink. But I don't. My friends think that's because I'm being stubborn and contrary. Not true. The point of drinking seems to be to lose control, and that's definitely not my idea of a good time. By the time the beer came out, there were only seven of us left. Daniel, me, Nicole, Brendan and Corey, of course. Haley stayed, too, as usual. So did Sam, which was new, having her come to our parties at all was new. Daniel didn't care. It's not like she'd tattle on us about the beer. After breaking out the booze, the next step was breaking into couples. As long as no one tried to use his room, Daniel was fine with people sneaking off to find a quiet place. He was taking some baby steps in that direction himself with Nicole, sitting on the love seat in the living room. Corey and Haley disappeared first. They were a couple of convenience. Had been since eighth grade. Neither was really into the other, but if there wasn't anyone better around, they'd pair up. Brendan's girlfriend had to work so he sat with me. Just talking, mostly about track. I think he was looking forward to giving back the captain's position. Some people don't like taking charge. Can't fathom that myself. Sam stayed with us, which was awkward, trying to include her in a conversation she had no interest in. We changed the subject, to be polite, but she seemed happy just to sit there chugging her beer. When she went to get another one, Brendan said, Did you notice how many were left? I pointed at my glass of coke. Right, he said. You wouldn't know. But I think it was down to a couple, so I'd better grab one. That left me on the sofa, inspecting my nails, trying not to glance over at Daniel and Nicole, deep in close conversation on the love seat. A thump on the sofa made me jump. Rafe vaulted the back of it, and landed beside me. I thought they'd never leave. He stretched out his legs, hit the coffee table, and sent my drink shaking. Whoops. He grabbed it. Yours. I nodded. He reached over me to put it on the side table, then wedged his beer bottle between his thighs. Sam and Brendan. Hi, he said. Now that I wouldn't have guessed. They just went to get a beer. I motioned to his. Or fight over the last one. I stopped myself before I asked where he'd been. That would imply I'd been disappointed that he'd left. So I just nodded at his drink again and said, Did anyone tell you house rules? When it's gone, it's gone. No BYOB. No dope. The corners of his mouth quirked. Yes, I said. I'm sure we're very quaint compared to your big city bashes. Wouldn't know. Never been to one. When I gave him a look, he said, big parties, sure. Just not big cities. Growing up, we were strictly small town, usually rural. I must have looked skeptical because he said, I'm being me tonight, remember? All truth, all the time. The big city crap is just that. Okay, 
then. I twisted to face him. If you're being honest, what about the accent? If that's supposed to be Texas, you really need to work on it. He laughed. You accusing me of using a fake draw? Every other girl up here does. He grinned, a little of that old arrogance seeping back in, but in a way that didn't seem as bad as usual. He leaned forward, voice lowering, though Daniel and Nicole were too far away to hear us over the music. It's real. A real mongrel mess. Part Texas, part Arkansas, part New Mexico, part wherever else Mom felt like living. We moved around a lot. He eased back a little, still close enough that our legs touched. What about you? I heard you weren't born here either. Oregon, I said. We moved when I was five. And is it true what I heard? You were found on the steps of a church? Wrapped in swaddling clothes? With a secret necklace that will unlock your true destiny when you turn 18. I laughed. That would make a much better story. No church, necklace, or swaddling clothes. But, yes, foundling is the correct term. Very Dickensian. Rafe was about to say something, when he noticed Daniel watching us. He leaned over and whispered, Any chance I can get my thirty minutes without the chaperone? I glanced at Daniel. He mouthed, Want me to get rid of him? I shook my head. Nicole followed the exchange, then stood, plucking Daniel's sleeve and saying something I couldn't hear. Daniel hesitated, then nodded. They got up and headed toward the kitchen. As they passed, Nicole leaned over the end table and whispered, We're going outside. Get some air. She winked. And leaving you two alone. Thanks, I said. They left, but the music was still booming, and Sam was heading back in through the dining room, which promised an even bigger problem. Want to go someplace quieter? Rafe asked. I nodded. He took my pop and his beer and followed me out. There was a back TV room and that's where I went first. All seemed quiet until I pushed open the door, and found Haley and Corey making out on the couch and not completely dressed. Before I could shut the door again, Haley jumped off Corey and yanked down her shirt. She started to snarl something at me. Then she saw Rafe standing at my shoulder. Hey, Haley, he said. Corey. The look she leveled on me was lethal. You, she said. You scheming little. I closed the door fast. Thanks, guys. Corey yelled. Sorry. I called back. How about outside? Rafe whispered. He caught my look and said, just on the porch or something. I think that's where Daniel and Nicole went. I have an idea. I led him upstairs. As I pushed open the door to Daniel's bedroom, I said, it's a way station not a destination. Rafe chuckled. I went in, leaving the door ajar, and headed for the window. It usually opened easily. Before Daniel dared to march out the front door with his bag packed, he'd take the window exit and ride his bike to our place. It'd been a while since we'd gone out to sit on the roof. We used to the three of us but since Serena died, whenever Daniel suggested it, I changed the subject. The house had been painted this summer and it seemed like the window hadn't been opened since. I wailed on it, then looked over to ask Rafe for help. He was standing in front of Daniel's dresser, holding our drinks as he looked at the photos shoved in the mirror frame. You guys really have been friends a long time. He pointed the beer bottle at one. What are you there? Six. About that. He grinned. I like the pigtails. He leaned in to look at a few others. Someone yelled something downstairs, and I said, Come on, 
suddenly realizing I really didn't want to be found with Rafe in Daniel's bedroom, however innocent the explanation. Rafe took his time, still checking out the room. He gestured at a pile of textbooks on the floor. What's he use those for? Weightlifting. If you showed up in class more often, you wouldn't be asking that. Daniel's not a dumb jock. No kidding. He leaned over to read the titles. Prila? Please tell me those belong to his older brothers. An uncle. They're Daniel's now. A little outdated but, I shrugged. He looked at me like he thought I was kidding. Everyone in town joked about Daniel taking over Chief Carling's job, and when he was little, even he thought he wanted to be a cop. Then he spent a year in cadets and realized paramilitary careers weren't for him. Daniel had his own very firm ideas of right and wrong, and didn't like following anyone else's. So he'd set his sights on law. It wasn't a sure thing. Daniel was a solid A- student, but he really worked for those grades. Harder than I did, which made me feel bad sometimes. I finally got Rafe over to the window and held the drinks while he yanked it open. Then I handed them back and told him to wait. Can I ask where we're going, he said. Up. He grinned. Should have guessed. After you then. Fourteen. From the window, I swung over to the porch roof. I took the drinks from him, set them down, and climbed onto the main roof. By the time I was there, Rafe was on the porch roof, holding the drinks up to me. I grabbed them and he clambered up. Then I stood, carefully, and walked to my usual place the flatter roof on the storage space above the garage. Rafe sat beside me. I handed him his beer and looked out into the dark forest. As I inhaled the smell of it, I closed my eyes and relaxed, but I didn't feel that usual slow stream of energy seeping in. Maybe it was too late for that and I was too tired. If anything, the energy seemed to be flowing out, leaving me blissfully relaxed, even a little lightheaded. When I glanced over at Rafe, he was staring into the night, sipping his beer looking just as calm, happy even. Neither of us said a word, but it wasn't an awkward silence. Just, nice. After a few minutes, he said, better not let my thirty minutes slip away, hey. I'm not wearing a watch. His grin sparked at that, and I felt this tingle in my gut, a slow heat, as if there was more than coke in my glass. I glanced away and took a gulp. It didn't help. I felt weirdly disconnected. Like when a summer boy sneaked rum into my coke on our first and last date. I knew what booze tasted like now, though, and my pop was fine. So, you wanted to get to know me, he said. I laughed, and the fuzzy feeling evaporated. Um, no, I don't think I ever said that. Close enough. Here's your chance. Ask me anything and I'll reply with relative honesty. Relative. I'm the mysterious new guy in town. You like that? You just won't admit it. So, yes, relative honesty. Ask me anything. Fine. What's the scariest thing you've ever done? He laughed. Wow. Straight for the jugular. He took a deep breath. Okay. Scariest thing? Scariest thing I've ever gone through was my mom dying. But you said scariest thing I've done. That would be coming here. I'm used to moving, like I said. But this was different. I'm not a legal immigrant, obviously, but we needed to get away, and we knew we'd inherited this cabin so we had to take the chance and hope nobody asked too many questions. You had to get away because of Annie. Because you were afraid she'd lose custody of you. Partly, and partly, he chugged his beer, as if shoring up his nerve. 
The scariest thing I've ever done was coming here, and the dumbest thing I've ever done was the reason I had to. After a minute of silence, I said, are you going to tell me or was that just a tease? I expected a smile. Instead, he drained the rest of his beer in one long, almost desperate swallow. I took money from the wrong people, he said. I stiffened, certain he was pulling his bad boy crap again. But he'd gone very still, watching me, his eyes anxious, like he wished he could take the words back but was glad he couldn't. I'd asked for honesty. He'd given it, more than he should, because he wanted to earn my trust, wanted it badly enough to offer this. I wondered why, but I couldn't seem to hold on to the thought, couldn't seem to care as that lazy, drifting feeling returned. I knew he was waiting for me to say something. But what? I was dying to ask what he'd done, but even for me, being that blunt crossed a line. So I was wrong, I finally said. You are a badass. He laughed at that, a long whoosh of relieved laughter, the spark returning to his eyes. That's right. I've earned my rep the hard way. I'm as bad as they come. He leaned in, until his breath tickled my hair. Seriously? That's the worst thing I've ever done, as well as the dumbest. Otherwise, I'm strictly minor league. He lifted the empty beer bottle. First drink I've had in about six months. I've been drunk once in my life. It was after my mom died. I went to a party, and I started drinking, and I didn't stop until I woke up covered in puke. Which, let me tell you, is a serious turn on for girls. I bet. I've smoked pot once. He leaned in again and whispered, you'll notice a lot of firsts and lasts in this confession. He set his empty bottle aside. I was fourteen, in a new place, trying to make friends. Annie caught me. Dragged me away and said if she ever caught me doing that again, she'd tell mom, who was sick then, so it was the last thing she needed. I found new friends. He shifted getting a little closer but subtly, like he was only restless. What else? I've shoplifted. Small stuff, years ago. Another new school, more bad choices in friends. You'll notice a lot of that pattern, too. I almost broke into a house once. A guy told me this other kid swiped his iPod and he wanted me to get it back. I almost fell for it. At least he bothered lying to me. Most times, kids just figured I'd be happy to help them do something illegal. Because you look like the type. Yeah, but not in the way you mean. A lot of the places we went small towns and that were very white. You're lucky here. I mean, I'm sure you get some problems, but you're... Sheltered. I didn't mean it like that. It's okay. I know I am. When I leave Salmon Creek, there's a distinct change in tone. I motioned to his arm, now covered by his jacket. I saw your tattoo. Hopi, isn't it? The Crow Mother. Very good. Yeah, Mom was Hopi. Annie and I got the tattoos after she died. He went quiet then snapped out of it and tugged his jacket sleeve up to give me a better look. It was a gorgeous tattoo. Before he pulled the sleeve down, I touched the cat's eye bracelet. I like that, I said. From a girlfriend. Looks like something a girl would give a guy. Right idea, wrong person. It was from my mom. Last gift before she died. Again that quiet grief threatened to fall. Again he shook it off. Anyway, so, yes, mom was native and my father was, apparently, Latino. So kids would try to get me to commit their criminal acts for them, either figuring I'm a dumb Indian who needed money for booze or a dumb Mexican who needed it for dope. Either way, 
they were sure I was dumb enough to do something illegal. A pause, then a crooked smile. And, apparently, they were right. Another minute of silence. The question was hanging there, what did you do? Instead I said, are you, okay? You mean, are we in danger of federal marshals barreling through the woods with a warrant for my arrest? Nah. It wasn't like that. I just... After our mom died, we didn't have as much money as she thought we did, because Annie and I had sneaked into her savings to get stuff for her. Medicine, food she liked, whatever. It wasn't bad at first. Annie was working. Two jobs sometimes, and selling her sculptures on the side. Mom was a carver, and Annie got the artistic genes. I wanted to quit school and work, so she could concentrate on her art, but she wouldn't let me. She helped me get a part-time job, though, so I felt better about it. I thought of the girl I'd met. Tried to imagine her as the big sister who dragged her brother away from pot-smoking friends, wouldn't let him quit school, took care of him. It sounded like he was talking about a completely different person. I guess, in some ways, he was. And then the accident happened, I said. Yeah. The damage, it took a while to develop. At first Annie could work, but then, not so much. She's just, she's not interested in stuff like that anymore. Out here, she'd be happy to wander around the woods all day, find a stream when she's thirsty, eat berries when she's hungry, nap when she's tired. So you needed money. He nodded and looked out over the forest. Annie knew we needed money. She still understood that. She met these guys and they offered her some, and the old Annie she would have told them, but she's not like that anymore and... He kept his gaze straight ahead, face hard. I got there just in time, and I, I didn't want to ever have to worry about that again. So there were these other guys, drug guys. A buddy of mine was a runner for them. I got him talking, found out they were doing a deal and had money to pay for it, so I... Helped yourself. Yeah. Seemed easy. And it was. Only I found out later why it was so easy because those guys were connected and no one else was stupid enough to rip them off. Until I came along. He smiled, but it faltered and finally fell. And, having won 30 minutes of your time, I think I just gave you 30 minutes of reasons to run the other way as fast as you can. I don't run away. He looked at me, startled and what I saw in his eyes was so raw that my breath caught and all I could do was sit there, staring at him, that weird floating feeling trickling through my veins. That wasn't what I meant to talk about, he said, his voice low. I really wanted to impress you, Maya. You did. I leaned forward and kissed him. His eyes widened, then his lips parted and he kissed me back mouth warm and firm against mine and that floating feeling washed over me and through me, and it was so amazing that when it ended, I just stayed there, my face so close to his I could feel his breath, see those incredible amber eyes, and that was all I could see, all I wanted to see. We hung there, face to face, just staring, then he said, yes, and I said, yes, and he kissed me again, and it was no awkward, Hesitant, first date kiss. It started at third date, deep and hungry, bodies colliding, and I'd like to say he started it but I honestly wasn't sure. This tiny voice in my head screamed slow down, but it was so small and so faint that I could barely hear it and I didn't want to. All I felt was Rafe's mouth on mine, his arms around me, his body against me, and I didn't care about anything else. It was like jumping from a cliff, a terrifying, exhilarating, mind-blowing rush, and I didn't want it to end, didn't care where it led, only wanted to follow. I could feel his heart beating, and I could hear it, 
pounding. I even swore I could smell him, just him. The world seemed to spin and fade, and I drifted in and out, and that voice kept saying that something was wrong, something was very wrong, but I didn't care. One minute we were sitting up, making out. The next we were lying on the roof, and I was on top of him, and I didn't know how I got there. I was kissing him and then, all of a sudden, I wasn't. He was holding my face in his hands, poised above his, as he panted softly, his pupils so huge I could drown in them. Hate to ask, he said, struggling for breath. How much did you drink? Nothing. Just coke. Oh. He held me there another moment, searching my gaze, his breath coming in soft puffs, fingers in my hair, looking like he was struggling to hold me there, away from him. I strained against his hands, and he said, okay, hesitantly, like he wasn't sure it was okay. Then he kissed me again deep and hard, like he didn't care if it was okay. Only it wasn't the same now. His hesitation kept playing in my head, and that little voice got louder until finally I heard myself saying it aloud, something's wrong. It's all right, he murmured. I won't try anything. Just this, okay. His mouth lowered to mine. Just this. He kissed me, and I realized he was on top of me now and I didn't remember that happening. I pulled away, saying louder, something's wrong. He blinked, hard, like he was clearing his head, and I was suddenly really aware of him, on top of me, holding me down and I panicked, struggling up so fast my elbow caught him in the chin, and he fell back. I looked around. Everything was hazy. I struggled to my feet, blinking hard, feeling like I'd just stepped off a merry-go-round. My uh. Rafe's voice seemed distant and distorted and I said again, something's wrong, but the words came out mumbled and thick. I looked down at my empty Coke glass. I remembered Rafe handing it to me at the sofa. Remembered him offering to carry it. Oh God, I whispered. He stepped toward me. I stumbled back, and he lunged to grab me, calling Maya, as I scrambled down the roof. The world kept spinning and I couldn't focus, couldn't think, could only see Rafe coming at me, lips parted in words I didn't hear. I inched back until I was at the edge. Then I crouched and jumped and as I did, I realized what I'd done, saw the ground rushing up and then... Thump! I landed in a crouch, gasping as pain slammed through my legs. I blinked hard, certain I was hallucinating. I couldn't possibly have leaped off a two-story roof and landed on my feet. I heard a shout and saw Rafe dangling over the edge. He hit the ground and turned toward me. My heart jammed into my throat and I stumbled back, saying, No. My uh. Sam jogged around the corner. I stepped toward her, but my legs wouldn't hold me and I went down, landing on all fours, hearing the thump of running feet from both sides, Rafe and Sam. Stay away from her, Sam said, then yelled. Daniel. I didn't Rafe began. Whatever happened, it wasn't me. More running footsteps. Heavy. Daniel. Maya. The footsteps picked up speed. What's going? My drink, I whispered as Sam crouched beside me. Something in my drink. A bone-crunching crack. Then a thump as Rafe hit the ground beside me. I scrambled back. Nicole helped me to my feet, and pulled me out of the way as Daniel bore down on Rafe, his face livid. Get up, Daniel said. Rafe stayed down, lifting his hands. If Maya's been dosed. If. If. Are you saying she's faking it? No. Obviously something happened. I mean maybe her drink was spiked. 
but I had nothing to get up. Rafe didn't. Sam stepped behind him, blocking his escape. Go ahead, Sam said. Stomp him. Daniel continued forward. Get up, you. Screw that, Sam said. If he does get up, I'll hold him for you. Stay out of this, Daniel said. Just leave him, I said, my voice still thick, the world still tilting. Let him go. Daniel didn't seem to hear me and kept bearing down on Rafe. I staggered forward to stop him, but now it was Corey taking my arm and pulling me back. Daniel, I said. Don't. Branches crackled. A blur burst from the forest. It charged so fast all I could see was that blur. Then it jumped between Rafe and Daniel. A cougar. Not Marv or the new Tom, but a female, planted between them, facing Daniel, lips curled back. She let out a snarl. I jerked forward. Corey caught me and held my arm. I'm not exactly sure what happened next. I faded again, everything sliding in and out of focus, no matter how hard I struggled to stay alert, heart pounding at seeing that cougar so close to Daniel, the house, and safety too far away. I remember the cat snarling. I remember Daniel backing up. And I remember Rafe, lying on the ground, saying, It's okay. It's okay over and over in this calm voice, completely calm, like he didn't even see the cougar. The cat backed up, getting closer and closer to Rafe and he didn't move a muscle and I remember thinking, she's protecting him, which was crazy, but that's what I thought. Then the world blinked, and my legs gave way. As I went down, Daniel ran toward me, and I opened my mouth to shout for him not to turn his back on the cat but she was already twisting away. I don't remember anything else. No, that's a lie. I remember one more thing. I remember the cougar turning away and I remember what I saw on her flank. A dark patch of fur in the shape of a paw print. The rest of the audiobook will be continued in the next episode. Join us on Patreon for early access or more great audiobooks. A link is provided in the video description.